Okay, we might kick off our next session, which is on bioprinting, art, and science. Um, I'm just going to introduce our two speakers now so that we can move through seamlessly after. Um, our first speaker is Svenja Katz. She is a contemporary artist and a lecturer at the University of Tasmania. I'm very excited to see her presentation because people keep telling me how cool her artwork is. Um, and our second speaker is Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens, who has just started a future fellowship um, which is also very exciting. I'm just going to tell you what it is about. Um, you know, I'll tell you what it's yeah, about. Yeah, why don't you? Presentation so you can okay, just let, me just, let me just give a quick sentence because um, the Future Fellowship examines the cultural history of the experiment and contemporary practices of experimentation from the emergence of 19th century scientific labs to contemporary experimental art. Um, so that will also touch on the 3D printing aspects, uh, which is definitely part of experimentation. So I will hand over to Svenja now. Thank you very much. And thank you very much um, to Matthew as well for inviting me to come along today to speak. It's always um, wonderful to actually um, connect with an audience outside of just the arts and humanities. So thank you very much. Um, today, as you'll see from my slide here, I'll be talking a bit about um, one of my recent projects. But I'll give you also a little bit of a background of um, my practice, where it's come from, and also where it'll be going. And then it'll w work nicely in terms of complementing the discussion of Elizabeth afterwards. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, I actually am a visual artist, um, but I've been working across art and science um, since about 2007 as part of my PhD, which I completed here at QUT in a creative partnership with the Creative Industries Faculty and the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation. I was really fortunate um, to have Z Upton as my supervisor, so I was really integrated into the Tissue Repair and Regeneration Group. And that actually allowed me to go into the lab to get trained with using the biotechnologies and to experience firsthand how do you grow cells, how do you actually do tissue engineering, all of those things. And that really informed my artistic um, practice. So a lot of my work, so there you can see back when I had short hair as a you know, first year PhD student, fascinated by looking through the microscope and observing cells. And I also got to do things, so cell and tissue culture, also um, some genetic engineering, just basic stuff, so introducing um, uh, fluorescence into the cells with green and red um, proteins, fluorescent proteins from marine organisms. Um, and I produced a range of work, so sculptural work, video work, um, across a whole range of different mediums. Um, one of the projects, just to give you a bit of an idea of how the cell culture comes it, into it, was towards the immortalization of Kira and Rama. Um, and this was a project where I actually went to the abattoir to get two fetal calves. And what I was really interested in was the use of fetal calf serum in the development of a lot of these technologies. So the way that you actually work with um, the serum, which is derived from the blood of fetal calves, um, as part of the nutrient supplement that you use for growing cells. I was really interested in, well, where do these calves come from? And, in, and as, as an inexperienced scientist, and not a scientist at all, I th had these visions that they were actually being grown in like that somewhere in, in a um, commercial sort of you know, industry. But really what I found out was that a lot of the fetal calves are, the, um, are actually a byproduct from meat production. So what I was quite interested in was actually looking at the boundaries between life and death. So I went to the abattoir, got the fetal calves, isolated cells, and they'd been dead for about two days. And then I seeded them into um, a silkworm cocoon that was as part, displayed as part of a sculptural bioreactor. So it was kind of looking at how when we're working with biotechnology, it shifts our understanding because those bodies were dead and yet they were also partially alive. Um, but also looking at how we, you know, we might want to distance ourselves from a lot of the technologies, but at the same time we're implicated into them because of the processes that are already embedded. So these processes of consumption that we're often not aware of. So it was sort of looking at a range of those things. Um, I also developed other work with um, tissue engineering and things like that, but that gives you a little bit of an idea. And the aim of the work that I was doing at IBI was really around um, the critical and creative affordances of biotechnologies. More recently, I've been lucky enough to work with the um, Center for Regenerative Medicine with um, Professor Dietmar Hutmacher and a lot of his research team, exploring particularly the creative affordances, um, working with biofabrication. 
So um, this is a project that came out of a um, Creative Sparks um, grant from the Brisbane City Council, which was sort of a starting point for us to investigate opportunities for collaboration. Um, initially, we were, I was interested in exploring some of the um, scaffold production techniques and to actually um, develop a basic perfusion bioreactor system. So that's where you actually push the media through the structure so that you can actually feed it. Um, but also have a holographic display system that would also use a kind of projection of the aliveness of the structure to kind of provoke empathy. So how do you actually provoke empathy for um, living products? That was sort of the initial framework um, that we were working from. Here you can see um, this is actually Tony Ausler, who's a very famous um, video artist, and that was kind of how I imagined this little entity might look. Um, but as we sort of started working with those technologies, and I was also really inspired by a lot of the, um, the science fiction movies that were coming out at the time, so that's also where it was wonderful to see uh, Matthew's talk and where he was actually talking about Westworld and uh, the way in which a lot of these um, contemporary sort of popular imagery really sort of start to interrogate a lot of the emerging technologies. Um, and so Westworld, Black Mirror, all of these sorts of things also um, became really interesting to me. And then also what was actually playing out in terms of what's being pitched as a legitimate project. So um, here you've got the 2045 Avatar project. Um, and this was a project that was initiated by um, Dmitry Itz, um, Itzkop. And it's a really a kind of based on this staying alive, you know, immortality through um, engineering kind of approach where he's really proposing, again, our biological bodies, so imperfect, so terrible. We actually need to create a robotic body. We need to develop an artificial brain so that we can live forever. So you can see again, really problematic assumptions that are playing themselves out here. You've got these problematic assumptions around also access. So who has access to these technologies that will be able to become immortal, but it also starts to reinforce a lot of these ideas around the mind-body dualism. And the fact that again, all of who we are, our consciousness is just in the brain. So if we can just somehow transport our brain into a robotic body, it wouldn't that be a perfect system? And then eventually we could become a completely digital entity. So you can see here it goes all the way through. And the last avatar, Avatar D, um, in 2040 to 2045, is actually going to be a holographic projection of a body and a human. And that's how you'll achieve this immortality. So again, really problematic. Um, but there are other things that are playing themselves out in that area of um, notions of immortality as well. Whom I was another um, project that was looking at human resurrection through artificial intelligence. So again, this is a way of um, using artificial intelligence and um, nanotechnology to be able to preserve your identity so that again, you could live forever. Um, again, this is one of those projects that sits sort of in that space where it could be more of a speculative account and it's sort of, you know, um, is difficult to determine whether it's a serious project or operates more on the level of provocation. But then you've got these other um, projects, so Eternomy and then the Eternine, which are two projects that are talking about how they could um, essentially harvest information from your digital footprint and then recreate you um, and preserve you as a kind of digital entity that can continue to post in social media after you're dead and can maintain that connection with your loved ones. So, I mean, again, really, really um, interesting, but also problematic um, uh, projects. So along with this, what I kind of find interesting is, again, even in the sort of science realm, you've got this um, emphasis on the brain as being the center of consciousness, the center of identity. People like John Smart who are proposing, well, if we can just chemically preserve the brain with glutaraldehyde, which will just kind of bind proteins, later on we can resurrect you because we can scan those neural connections and then um, have your consciousness preserved, all right? A little bit like cryopreservation um, when that became um, popular. Sebastian Sung also believes that, you know, our, the root of our identity are just the neuronal connections that we have. So if you can again map the brain, you would be able to preserve consciousness. Um, of course, when you look at these um, proposals, um, it's again this really limited kind of reductionist perspective without taking into account of the complexity of the body. 
So the body, the brain, of course, is connected into the whole nervous system. You know, you've also had Neumann Deutsch with his very popular book that talked about um, the pl brain plasticity and the fact that our brains do change over time and they change particularly through in, um, embodied interaction with the world. So we're not just this floating brain that kind of goes around that doesn't have any actual connection to the world around us, but it's very much about being part of a body, being embodied and embodied kind of interaction with the world. And now you've got also uh, more recent developments that talk about relate, you know, the relationship with, of hormones to how to brain function, um, and also the gut and the brain and the way that you know the inter your your, flo uh, your the flora inside your gut will also determine how your brain operates and things like that. So. For me, I kind of was looking at all of this and that was sort of a source of inspiration to kind of think about, well, you know, what happens in this terrain? And also, you know, starting to think about immortality and the possibilities of that. And also this regard around how our bodies are seen as essentially a spare part that can just be incrementally replaced. And particularly with thing, new technologies like biofabrication, where your heart fails, just print a new one, put it inside. Oh, you've lost a limb, that's okay. Print a new one and just attach it and that's fine. You know, really, you can just replace the entire body and all you need to preserve is, again, this mystical consciousness. All right? So these were all things that we were quite interested in interrogating um, as part of the project with Dipmar's team. So one of the sort of starting mechanisms that we developed was biosynthetic systems. And this was an exhibition that was actually displayed just across the road at the, um, at the block. Um, and that was with a big sort of um, research team starting to look and explore some of those implications. So thinking around, well, if you could magically, and again, I'm going, I don't believe that you could preserve a consciousness in a digital format, but if you could, and you could transplant it into another body, but it's a different body, maybe a younger body with a different gut flora, with um, different physical capabilities, is it still the same person, you know? Is it still this, the same person or the same consciousness if you transfer it into a digital interface that again has very different embodied kind of connections into the world? Or is that again different? What happens when you actually merge biotechnology and artificial intelligence and you create something that evolves, that has its own agency, you know, that it's not just static? Is it the same person then if it becomes different over time? So these are sort of some of the questions that we um, wanted to interrogate. And we did that through um, creating a series of works that basically operated as a to stimulate debate. So one of the things that we included were um, a live sort of 3D printing demonstration that also showcased the scaffold. Part of the reasoning behind that is that people do have this perception that is again around this hype that you can 3D print an organ now. You know, that we're, you know, like maybe two years away and then suddenly we're going to be having all these organs printed everywhere, but we're nowhere near that, you know. So it was really trying to showcase that, yes, you know, the technology is evolving rapidly, but we're very far off and the body is a much more complex space than we, than we um, are often led to believe. So it was kind of showcasing, well, this is where we're currently at in terms of the, the height of 3D printing and um, what's going on in the labs. So um, that was sort of set up, but it was also coupled with um, some of these early engagements. Um, and this was work that was developed with um, Bill Hart. And you can see there my face, which was kind of mapped with a 3D system. Um, I also wrote my handwriting and I started to write um, a kind of narrative that was around imagining what it would be like to be myself, but as a biotechnological kind of AI entity. So I sort of started to write this narrative. And then Bill created this writing machine here, which actually draws on program neural networks to recombine and to recreate that narrative in my handwriting, but that it actually changes and evolves over time as well. So it sort of was about this idea of, well, what happens if you do create a machine, you upload your consciousness and it does evolve? What might it start to lament? What might it start to say? And there was a kind of pathos to the way that the words sort of started to combine. And sometimes it would make sort of sense and then it would deteriorate and then it would be like nothing, nothing, nothing and just repeat and sort of. So it was kind of a, quite a provocative work, I think. And that was combined as well with these video works of, um, of my kind of face that would sort of split apart and move. And we're sort of around again this kind of disembodied entity that was now in a completely different um, environment. 
So along with that, we also were working with some of the electro um, spun scaffolds that were produced um, in the lab. So here you can see one of the scaffolds that um, Felix Wunner, who will be actually presenting a bit later today, and I'm sure he'll tell you about his PhD project. So we were fortunate enough to work with um, one of the um, electro spinning devices that he had developed, but we actually redesigned it, well, he redesigned it to actually also integrate my handwriting. Um, and then to seed cells onto that so that they would grow. Um, here you can see sort of one of the, um, the scaffold at high resolution with the cells growing over it. And they were actually um, tagged with the green fluorescent protein so that they would fluoresce under UV light, which because that would allow us to actually track the movement of the cells. And that movement was then translated into the development of an STL file, so a three-dimensional file which you could then print. So it was also around, well, looking at cells as also having agency, that they're not these inert materials, but they also, you can't always control and predict how organisms are going to, um, to progress, especially when you have evolutionary pathways, whether it's an, um, a, a synthetic kind of evolutionary system or an organic evolutionary system. There's always an element of uncertainty. Um, and so it was around allowing those cells to actually have agency on the three-dimensional structures that they're producing. But again, these are all sort of early ideas that we were investigating. And this also came, um, we developed because we were interested in seeing what the scientists were really keen to develop because it also challenged their, the limits of the technology. So it was also around, is this an interesting problem for a PhD student to work on from a technical perspective and also from a kind of philosophical perspective? So we developed also this um, biomonument and that sort of started to house the, um, a resin printer that would print the three-dimensional structure created by the cells. And then in the top, there was a little holographic projection of the, um, the cells moving through the um, structure as well um, with text that was generated. So it was, again, all of these interconnected elements that started to encourage um, the viewers to um, consider some of the implications and to kind of become provocations for further dialogue. Um, we also showed um, aspects of that um, work at the National um, Science Week event, the Festival of Bright Ideas. What was really fantastic about that, there you can see um, Felix and myself talking to literally thousands of school children. And so this is also where, as an artist, what, what I'm always interested in is the way that art can actually have multiple um, functions. But it's not about here, you know, if you looked at this, you could go, is it about sci um, science, communication and PR? Absolutely not. The idea is about critical engagement. So you actually present students with a range of options and you get them to actually think critically about the technologies. That's the, the purpose that I kind of see in connecting um, with the public and also with school children, that it's about encouraging that critical debate. So for future iterations, we're hoping to develop this project further. Um, and again, looking at the connections to the 2045 Avatar project, looking at notions around robotic bodies, um, interconnections in that way. So thinking about how you might connect the, um, the programmed neural networks, but to actual neural networks, and then actually develop. And that you can do that with um, uh, using a multi-electrode array where you actually seed the cells on there so that you can send and receive electrical signals. Um, I've got a, fr a good friend of mine who is based at Symbiotica, um, which is a dedicated art and science lab in Perth, which um, Elizabeth will talk more about. Um, but actually, so the resources are there in being able to actually refine that technology to work with a robotic body. And that's where we're kind of interested in that interaction between programmed artificial intelligence and then also real neurons which are again kind of seen as the brain even though again very reductionist viewpoint but it's about that critical interrogation and drawing on the work of that a lot of artists have done previously so artists like ken ronaldo who's done um, work with fish that are controlling these robotic bodies and then also people like um, stelark so again, this comes to, well, why, okay? And I think that's going to be a question that um, you'll see Elizabeth talking probably a lot more about. <laughs> but again, for me, as I've sort of alluded to, it's about prov provocation, that art actually, the role of artists is not to provide solutions. This is something that Oren and Yonat continually stress, who are leaders in the field of art and science. And it's about debate, but also critical interrogation. 
And these are just some of the projects that are really pioneering works within the, um, the realm of art and science. Joe Davis, who was one of the first people back in 1986 to 2000 to um, explore um, how you might encode information into DNA. Eduardo Katz, who created the first transgenic organism, so a bunny um, that was engineered with the green fluorescent protein, intended to be a pet. But it was, again, about a provocation. What's happened since then? We actually do have glowfish, which are transgenic pets. So it's almost like preempting where the technology might end up in a kind of speculative way. Paul Venus, who did his latent figure protocol, you can look at it there, repurposing um, sort of um, technologies to actually draw attention to bigger implications around copyright, copyright of biological organisms, tissue culture and art project in their um, disembodied cuisine, which um, Elizabeth, I'm sure, will touch on more, but really interrogating this idea of lab-grown meat. I would just like to add, corn already <laughs> exists. It has texture like meat. It's a microprotein. Of course, that puts people off because it's fungus. So again, it's around how do we shift the kind of cultural attitude where we don't have to have meat? You know, I just, to me, it's, it's kind of quite bizarre. Um, and then, of course, Stalark, um, who had his um, ear on the arm, which was looking at um, kind of, um, you know, Im embedding the scaffold in another place. So, and you'll see a lot of artists will actually start thinking about well, why not re replicate the same body? Why, might, why not extend it? Why not actually allow um, other avenues of thinking around embodiment and what constitutes the normal body or the ideal body? So it's, again, that critical interrogation. Um, I'd also just like to mention that you'll, what you'll see as well is the growing interest in the area of art and science. So the Science Gallery Network is something that you can see was originally established in Dublin, but has since spawned multiple offshoots. So we've got um, a Me Dublin, London, Melbourne, um, Bengaluru, Venice, and Detroit. And um, you can see, again, it's about provoking um, you know, those, the, the de debate with the wider public around things like automation, climate change, uh, synthetic biology. And one of their latest call outs was spare parts. And that's one of the, um, the call outs where we've put in an application which we're hoping will allow us to showcase our project, looking at, again, this idea of immortality and, again, the, the whole body being seen as a spare part. So allowing us to actually move into a space that allows the public to connect with the realities of what's going into the lab, but also to critically interrogate all of those speculations around wh where we might go into the future. So I will um, just sort of mention that this sort of forms part of an ongoing series of explorations. Um, other areas that I'm interested in as well, which all kind of connect into this idea of a distributed self, how you might actually proliferate your identity through multiple avenues. Um, and through both digital and um, biotech avenues. So looking at, well, what might happen if we have non-human offspring? What might happen if instead of procreating um, via children, I can actually infect someone with a virus that will replicate um, fragments of my DNA? What might happen if, you know, so it's asking these sort of questions to probe, well, what are we comfortable with? What are we fearful of? So it's again um, sparking that um, debate. And I will finish there, which hopefully leaves me at around about the right time. Elizabeth is very impressed because sometimes I do presentations where I'll go, I have 62 slides for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, but I'd also just like to say, um, you know, thank you to all the people that I work with. Um, when I talk about a lot of my projects, they are collaborative. So I do work with a whole bunch of really amazing um, people, including um, the Tissue Repair and Regeneration Group, the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, but also most recently with with, um, people from Tasmania, so from the Creative Exchange Institute, and also Bill Hart, who's from the School of Creative Art. So really amazing people that all have excellent skills. Thank you to them. And I will end there.